Uh, let's take a moment to welcome all of our guests that are tuning in online and who are here physically. Welcome to Transformation Church. Thank you so much for, for being here. And let's give it up for the mighty men and all the beautiful women of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And also, let's give it up to the TC family. It is so, so good to see everybody. Uh, before I dive into the message, uh, I want us to take a moment to be really aware in this cultural moment that we, that we find um, ourselves in concerning the Supreme Court and um, handing over uh, the rights of states as it pertains to abortion. But what I want to talk about is this. Since the genesis of Transformation Church 12 years ago, our position and our posture has not changed and will not change. Our position and our posture is this, is we're going to love men and women who've had abortions, who are thinking about having abortions, who are thinking about giving their children up for adoption or fostering, all the way from the womb to the tomb, we will consistently love as Jesus has loved. Amen. Now, that's, that's who we've always been, that's who we will always be. The culture doesn't determine our response, Christ determines our response to the culture. But what I will say, and this is really important, um, in my 12 years of, of being lead pastor here, um, I have never, not from our congregation, but I've just never seen um, our nation uh, just rage the way it is raging, like people are viscerally angry and afraid. And before you disagree with someone's fear and anger, let's do what Jesus did. Let's take time to know why the hurt and anger is there. In an angry world, you don't give back anger. In a hostile world, you don't give back hostility. In a chaotic world, we don't give back chaos. Jesus is our example. Jesus met people in the midst of that pain, and we have to do the exact same thing. And so I want to encourage us, in the midst of this moment, we at Transformation Church, we're going to continue, if you're new here, uh, we have a free grocery store where we feed 400 families a month. For, for, for 12 years, we filled backpacks full of food for kids who wouldn't eat healthily over the weekend. I think we're close to like a million meals, if not more. We're going to continue to give financially and serve at pregnancy crisis centers. We're going to continue to give financially and serve at roof ab uh, above for homeless. We're going to continue to do all the things that we have already done. And I lay that down because there's this narrative in culture that, well, well, once the baby's born, Christians don't care. My thing is this, have you seen how many hospitals are named after Christians and denominations? Did you know most orphanages were founded by Christians? And did you know that the 5% of the population, the highest percent of the population in America that adopts are white Christians? And so please don't buy the narrow lie that Christians don't care after babies. Well, I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for Transformation Church. We have cared. We're going to continue to care and care even more so. My hope and my prayer is that one day, not only will we have a free grocery store, we're going to have housing for those who are in need. We're going to have free dental. We're going to have free medical. But hold on, hold on. But all of that flows from the bloody cross of Jesus. To feed a man or a woman a meal, but don't feed them the bread of life, is spiritual stealing. It's not an either or. It's a both and. So please, family. In this angry and hostile moment, don't allow the culture to make you angry and fearful. Let's pray. Lord, there is so much that is going on on so many levels. But we want to be about kingdom love, kingdom grace, kingdom truth. May we not allow the chaos of the culture to shape us but the clarity of the king 
to guide us. And Lord, bless us at Transformation Church to be a blessing. And we pray that men and women who are considering uh, aborting their children or considering adoption, that we would be able to help. But we're gonna continue to stand in in the gap for all of humanity. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. All right, family, let's dive into it. So we are entering week four of our sermon series, The Bible Says What? On the count of three, I want you to say, The Bible Says What? Now, to my Caucasian brothers and sisters, you got to have some flavor with it, okay? What? And you got to dip with it. What? Okay, you all ready? One, two, three. What? I got to give you the Jordan fist on that. That's multi-ethnic church right there, baby. Way to go. Way to go. Okay, so, so, so this week, we're going to ask the question, is God, is the Bible anti-science? It, 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 is, is God like, well, you, you just have faith and don't worry about facts and, and don't worry about science. I mean, so, so we have to ask that question because sometimes there's a perspective, particularly for our young ones, that they have to give up their intellect to follow Jesus and that the Bible is a myth and kind of spiritual but doesn't really have an effect in the real life. And what I want to say, what I want to propose is, is this, is this, is God is not anti-science. Is God anti-science? No. God is not anti-science. As a matter of fact, what I want to try to demonstrate is this. All truth is God's truth. Theologians call that common grace. All truth is God's truth. Therefore, God is pro-science because all truth flows from him. Let's just take, um, let's just give a little illustration. Aren't you glad that people don't really get polio anymore because scientists and vaccines Yeah, amen. Um, Aren't you glad about the car that you drive? How about the planes you're in? How about the Hubble telescope that we can look? We got a, 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 a little tractor trailer on Mars sending us pictures. We got microwaves. We got, we got cell phones. You ever get an MRI? You ever go to the doctor? Those are all good things. And a God of grace says, all my knowledge to help humanity flourish flows from me. Now, what I want to do in this message is establish that, no, God is pro-science, but what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to get into a debate about how old the universe is or um, um, did Adam ride a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the Garden of Eden and how old is the days in Genesis. What I want to firmly establish is that we as followers of Jesus use science as a complementary tool to display who God is why God is great, why God is good. And then for some of you young ones, you're struggling with, well, but is this gonna be against my faith if I pursue physics or astronomy? No, it's not. It's actually going to enhance your capacity. You may or may not know this, but according to some research, scientists, 40% of them are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanna lay forth my case here. Is God anti-science? No, all truth is God's truth. Therefore, God is pro-science. So here begs the question, how is it that scientists can look at the same information and come to different conclusions? What I want to propose to you may be the most important thing that I'm going to say is, what glasses do you wear when you go to the evidence, because the glasses we wear are going to shape how we see it. I want to introduce you to a big term, all right? I'm going to explain it. It's called philosophical naturalism. On the count of three, say it. One, two, three. Philosophical naturalism. What does that mean? Let me show you a picture of what it means. Philosophical naturalism means this, that nature is all that exists. Therefore, there cannot be a God because God is outside of nature. So, regardless of what the evidence says, Big word, Latin word, ar piore, I have made my decision before the evidence that these are the facts and how I'm going to view them. So if you say nature is all that exists, every explanation has to have a natural one. Friends, that's not science, that's philosophy. Let me give an example. This is from Dr. Scott C. Todd of Kansas State University. He says this, even if all the data 
point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. So this is not a scientific definition. This is a philosophical definition. It's like saying, I've decided that the sky is yellow, even though it's blue. If I decided that it's yellow, it is because I've already made a decision beforehand regardless of the facts. And what I'm saying is, let's bring the facts to the table and then make a decision based on that. But if you start with nature is all that exists, that's the only answer you can come up with. Philosophically, as followers of Jesus, we are philosophical theists. What does that mean? There's an all-powerful personal creator God that is intimately involved in creation. So we believe that there is a God who created and who is involved. Really quick here, teenagers, when you get to college, philosophy 101, this is going to get asked this question, who created God? And you just lovingly raise your hand and say, If someone created God, then that someone is God, not the one we think is God, because God, by definition, is uncreated. God is the uncreated creator. In the words of Thomas Aquinas, he's the unmoved mover. God is the eternal one, the alpha, the omega, the one who was and is and is to come, the almighty. So if anybody created a God, it would not be God. Here's another one. If God is all powerful, can he make a rock so big he can't lift? Gotcha. Actually, you got yourself. You played yourself. God, by definition, doesn't have categorical size. He's infinite. Infinite doesn't have size. You can't have an infinite rock. A rock has dimensionality. So no, God can't make another infinite. So that's a wrong category mistake, and a philosopher should not teach that in school, particularly at a PhD level coming with that. Let's continue. So where does the evidence lead us? Number one, teenagers, the beginning of the universe points to a personal creator God. Okay, this is really deep here. This is going to cause you to think really hard. Nothing plus nothing is? Zero plus zero is? So if something has a beginner, or something has a beginning, it must have a? Well, the universe Scientifically, through cosmology, astronomy, physics, displays that it had a beginning. So let's look at some evidence. We're going to cite some famous astronomers and the like. So this is from Stephen Hawking. He, he's very famous, very intelligent. This is what he said. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. So let me pause here. Big Bang doesn't mean... We're going to explain what that means. But the point is, the universe began. Now, Mr. Hawking, though, came to this conclusion. And in his book, which I read years ago, he said, yes, the universe did come into existence, but I've developed this thing called imaginary time. And in imaginary time, the universe always existed. No disrespect, but... That's not science. Once again, that's philosophy. Science is what's repeatable and observable. Imaginary time, I can only imagine, you know what I'm saying? And so we're kind of stuck here that there's a beginning. Here's what astronomer Hugh Ross says. The Big Bang or creation event, I prefer that term actually, creation event, is an immensely powerful yet carefully planned and controlled burst of creation, a sudden release of power from which the universe sprang forth in an exquisitely controlled expansion. In an instant, time, space, matter, and energy, along with all the physical laws governing them all, came into existence from a source beyond the cosmos. Let's continue. This right here is Arno Pincius. He uh, is a Nobel laureate. He says, the best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, the Bible as a whole. Now, he's not saying the Bible is a physics textbook, but he's talking about creation and an orderly design fashion to do so. Second law of thermodynamics. According to this scientific law, teenagers, in a closed, isolated system like the universe, the amount of usable energy is decreasing. 
This law demonstrates that an eternal universe would have run out of energy by now or reached a state of total disorder. Since it has not, it must have had a beginning. By the way, remember that. That's going to help you in your physics class, on your ACT, your SAT. And if you want to impress your parents, you can tell them about that too. This is, this is Alan Sandage, another noted astronomer. He said this, the majesty of the Big Bang helped make him a believer in God, willing to accept that creation could only be explained as a miracle. So his scientific study of how the universe came into being from nothing led him to the point that this has to be super natural. This has to be beyond that. So as followers of Jesus, as people of faith, we can look at Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The job of Genesis is not to be a physics textbook, but we can use physics, we can use astronomy to go, wow, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, ex nihilo, that's a Latin word for out of nothing. So that's the first line of evidence. Number two, the fine-tuning of the universe points to a personal creator God. Let's pause here and do a little something, something. This is lecture, but I'm going to preach a little bit, give a little commentary. So I'm going to give a little commentary right now, something for you to think, think about. When was the last time that you went and just said thank you? Because it doesn't have to be that way. We take for granted that we get free oxygen. In a moment, we're going to see why that's a, a gift of incredible beauty and the hand of God. But before we do, let's talk about the fine-tuning of the universe that points to a personal creator, God. This is Roger Penrose of Oxford University, and he says this, Penrose finds the laws of nature tuned for life. This balance of nature's laws is so perfect and so unlikely to have occurred by chance that he believes an intelligent creator must have chosen them. So check this out. This is a Surface Book Pro. I can turn my PC into a tablet. By the way, Microsoft, if you are ready to do an influ influencer deal on Instagram, I am your guy. All the proceeds will go to needy children, my own. No, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, just kidding, we're gonna help the world, we're gonna help the world. I'm just saying, if y'all wanna work out a deal, hit a brother up. But, but, but check this out, check this out. What if you were walking on an island, no one was there, and boom, you found this tablet and you went, well, time and chance are amazing. Wow, all this design looks designed, but it can't be. If something looks designed, you gotta have a... So like if you went to the Van Gogh art show, which my family and I went to, it was awesome. Would you go, who's the artist? Or would you go, wow, time and chance? If you say time and chance, we might need to spend some time together. Walter Bradley, distinguished professor of engineering at Baylor, it's quite easy to understand why so many scientists have changed their minds in the last 30 years, agreeing that the universe cannot reasonably, ex reasonably be explained as a cosmic accident. L let me give you some of these examples, okay? Oxygen comprises 21% of the atmosphere. If it were 25%, fires would erupt. If it were 15%, humans would suffocate. And so when you take a breath, that's God's goodness to you. It doesn't have to be that way. And watch this. We live in what's called the Milky Way galaxy. And specifically, we live in what's called the Goldilocks arm of the Milky Way galaxy, where conditions just happen to be perfect for you and I to live. Imagine if you and I woke up in the morning and took a breath and said, it didn't have to be this way. Lord, I'm going to worship you today because I can breathe. I'm going to worship you today because I'm not turning into a spontaneous fire. If the universe was expanding at a rate one millionth more slowly than it is, the temperature on the earth would be 10,000 degrees. So from the creation event, our universe is still expanding. If it was going slower 
at a rate of one millionth more slowly, it'd be 10,000 degrees. I want to give you a silly illustration, but check this out. If you go to the beach in the South and you see black people on the beach, most likely, highly predictably, we will not be rotisserie chicken like our white brothers and sisters. We will be on a lawn chair with a fruity drink, a white towel over us, and a big old canopy. I tell my wife, she's like, don't you want to get some sun? I'm like, no, my tan is great. If you want to be rotisserie chicken, go right on ahead. But I'm good. I'm really good. I, I'm, I'm using humor, but at 10,000 degrees, y'all, we, we, we wouldn't even be able to live. So, 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 so when you walk outside and it's a hot day or cold day or any day, it's a gift. Imagine if we would begin to worship God because of his creation instead of neglecting his creation and taking it for granted. Let me say this very lovingly and very kindly. You and I don't even deserve oxygen. It is pure gift. The sun that shines is a pure gift. The rain that falls is a pure gift. All right, teenagers, if the gravitational force were altered by one part in 10 to the 40th power. That's one part in 10 with 40 zeros behind the 10. That's big. The sun would not exist. And the moon would crash into the earth or shear off into space. When uh, my father-in-law was alive, he passed away a few, year, few years ago. Uh, he's from Montana, he's a mountain man. And uh, when I met him at 18, uh, I didn't like him. He didn't like me. We both had baggage. He was white. I was black. And his white stepdaughter's bringing this black dude home. And he's like, what's going on here? And I'm like, what's going on with you? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, over the years, um, as, as the Lord began to change our heart and we came to fight for the faith, uh, my wife and I, predominantly by my wife, on a trip to Disney World, we actually locked him in a room, and Vicky shared the gospel with him and started crying. It was over at that point. That's when the Holy Spirit kicked in. Anyway, he comes to faith, and, uh, and ultimately, he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you're my son-in-law. I'm so proud of you. I, I love you. I'm honored. And so, like, we became, like, besties, man. I mean, we were golf together. And, of course, he, he, he started getting sick, and, and um, so all we could do was, like, just chill and hang out. But one of the things we would do in Montana is at night, there's no building, there, there's, there's no downtown. So all you can see is all these amazing stars and the moon, and it's beautiful. And we would just chill. We would just chill and just talk. He'd tell me about his stories that, you know, he, he had a, a middle school education. He wanted to build a log home, but no one could build the logs he wanted. He had a dream. He took a washing machine. He took a lawnmower and created this lathe. He actually created the modern day log home industry but he didn't get a patent on it or he'd be a gajillionaire. But anyway, that's the way his mind worked. And we'd have these great conversations. We just look up at the stars and I miss him. And when I go back to Montana, um, not only am I gonna think of my father-in-law, but I'm gonna think of my heavenly father when I look at his creation. What would happen if we stopped taking all the beauty around us for granted? It goes on. One impressive case is that of the fine-tuning of the cosmological constant. The fine-tuning is estimated to be at least one part in 10 to the 53rd power. That is one part in a 100 million, billion, 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 billion. That is a big number, almost as big as our national debt. <laughs> I had to, I got to. To get an idea of how precise that is, it would be like throwing a dart at the surface of the earth from outer space and hitting a bullseye one trillionth of a trillionth of an inch in diameter, less than the size of an atom. I don't have enough faith to not believe in a personal creator when I see the evidence. Let's continue. Arnold Penzias says this, astronomy leads us to a unique event, 
a universe that was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to provide exactly the conditions required to support life, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. So what do we do with this information? In light of this, if you are a naturalist, you can't have a supernatural explanation, so you have to do something. Guess what the current theory is now? The multiverse. Hey, listen, if it works for Doctor Strange and Spider-Man and Thor and Loki, why not for us? So the idea is, you, you know what? Um, our universe really isn't created because there's an infinite number of universes. We just got lucky. Friends, that's not science, that's science fiction. And then philosophically, think about, about this. If something is an infinite, you never arrive at the present. Let me give you this illustration. If you're driving your car from here to Texas and it's an infinite distance, when will you make it? When will you make it? If there was an infinite number of universes, we would have never made it to this one. Therefore, the evidence supports Psalm 19, 1, 2. The heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the works of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. I just wonder if God is speaking and we're not listening. Okay, okay. Spoiler alert. I'm going Obi-Wan. I've seen all of them. If you haven't, you can close your ears, but I got to say it because it fit in with the illustration, right? Okay. Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's having a rough time. The Jedi's ain't doing good, but he gets his mojo back at the end, and he's balling out against Darth Vader. By the way, Darth Vader, my goodness, the greatest villain of all time. But Obi-Wan put it on him, though. It was amazing. It's amazing. After Obi-Wan wins, his old Jedi master, Qui-Gon Jinn, appears to him. And Obi's like, man, I, I've been wanting to see you. I, I've been calling you. I've been wanting you to appear to me. And Qui-Gon Jinn says, I was here all the time, but you wasn't ready to see me. I wonder if through creation, you're going, where's God? And he's like, I've been here all the time. Are you ready to see me? Number three, let's look at the beauty and complexity of DNA that points to a personal God. Um, our DNA is the basic instructions for life. You know, if you find a letter and it's an intelligent letter and it's, and it's a beautiful letter and it's explaining things, you wouldn't go, this is amazing. This letter just happened by nothing for nothing and it's incredibly intelligent. Who would do that? Well, if you have a naturalistic perspective, you'd go, well, just because our DNA has information, there's a naturalistic example. Or you go, if something is intelligently designed, there must be an intelligent designer. I want to introduce you to Francis Collins. Francis Collins is one of the world's leading scientists and geneticists, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. This is what Francis said. So for me, faith in science always from the time of my conversion seemed incredibly complementary. Now, teenagers and young adults, I want you to grab a hold of this. As the director of the Human Genome Project, I have led a consortium of scientists to read out the 3.1 billion letters of the human genome. 3.1 billion letters of the human genome. Our own DNA instruction book. As a believer, I see DNA, the information molecule of all living things, as God's language and the elegance and complexity of our own bodies and the rest of nature as a reflection of God's plan. Let me pause here for a moment. Do you realize how intricately and how beautifully you are created at the deepest, deepest level? Now, I need you to do something. I need you to not let 
people who are marketing to you stuff to buy to tell you what beauty is. Why in the world do we pay people to give us low self-esteem to tell us what's not handsome, what's not beautiful, what's not in? When are we ever going to go, God, you created me. You are my designer. You fashioned me. You tell me that I'm beautiful. You tell me that I'm somebody. Man, how many hours in counseling sessions would we save ourselves if we stopped looking at airbrush magazine covers and saying, that's beautiful. God determines beauty. God determines your worth. God determines my worth. He's speaking. Will you believe his voice or the voice of the other? Now, for some of us, you may need therapy. Jesus and therapy are awesome. Jesus and medication are awesome. Jesus and counseling are awesome. Try them all. Let's talk to Francis some more. He says this, I have found there is a wonderful harmony in the complementary truths of science and faith. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome God can be found in the cathedral or in the laboratory. All of life is, all of life is. Listen, for some of you, you're gonna go into the medical field, go be the hands and feet of Jesus. Several years ago, I was seeing a, a back specialist for my back. You know, when you, when you use your body as a um, human uh, a crash car for a long time, you have damage. And so this doctor, he'd served in the military. I mean, he was phenomenal, one of the best at what he does. And we got to talking. And, you know, I'm always looking for ways to get in and talk about Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, my back broke. Did you know that on the cross Jesus broke the back of sin? You know, I'm, I'm always, I'm looking, man. I'm always looking. But I didn't have to do it with him. He, he goes, he goes, he goes, come here, come, come here. And he took me to his office. And he showed me a picture of surgeons doing surgery and Jesus was behind them. And he just started crying. He goes, when I go to mission trips to Latin America, I know I'm the hands of Jesus. I know I'm the love. Man, we was back there crying and my back didn't even hurt for a little bit. It was so good. So what I wanna say, is if you're in the medical, if you want to go into physics, you want to go into astronomy, you want to go into paleontology, you want to go into marine biology, you want to do all those things, that is God's domain. That is the king of kings' domains. He has created your mind to be brilliant. You don't have to throw your mind out at the door of faith. I want to propose to you that faith will increase your mind. You know how I know? Because it happened to me. I got a 16 on my ACT. No one in my family graduated college, what even idea to go to college. Now I'm sitting up here with two doctorates in my pocket. That's what God will do. Yeah, look, Dewey from the hood is a biblical scholar. So what I'm telling you is you don't have to throw your mind away, family. He'll do it. I love what he says here. By investigating God's majestic and awesome creation, Science can actually be a means of worship. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. For it was you who created me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Wow. Amen. Our sisters in Christ should feel safe around us. They carry the next generation. God came through the womb of a woman. Yeah, it takes 26 chromosomes from a man and 26 from a woman. I get that. But man, what a special favorite place to, to carry life. My mom... Um, was 16 when she was pregnant. Now, let me say, say this, and please hear my heart in this, right? If you don't want to get pregnant, don't have sex. <laughs> You're like, wait, wait. No, I mean, seriously, there's only one virgin birth. 
Now, of course, I'm not talking about rape and those types of things, right, which is horrible and awful. But at 16, she's pregnant. My dad's 17. She went to Thomas Jefferson High School. She was the first group of kids that was bused to this all-white school. So my mom is light-skinned. Uh, I suspect her dad was probably half white. That's why I'm 23% European, but ne nevertheless. So when she went to school, the black girls beat her up because she was light-skinned. And then the white people called her the N-word because she was black. So she's pregnant. She goes to the school nurse, and the school nurse tells her, go to California and abort him because this could ruin your life. She said a bunch of cuss words, no, and here I am. And so when I think about this, knit me together in my mother's womb. What a, what a treasure. And men, we should be advocates for our sisters, protecting, guarding, encouraging. Verse 14, I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. And I want you to know this too. Whether if you're a man or a woman and you've paid for an abortion or had one, there's forgiveness and grace and mercy for you. And your baby is with Jesus and your baby longs to see you one day. You don't have to go with guilt. You don't have to go with shame. You don't have to do any of those things. I got one more story. I'm going to go a little bit over it. That's all right. Y'all can't go nowhere anyway. Um, so this was years ago, y'all. This was like early in ministry. I'm talking like I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I was speaking at Houston Baptist, you know, university, a lot of college students, obviously. And I was sharing about forgiveness. And I just sensed the Holy Spirit say, there's someone here that needs to know that God forgives you for your abortion. He forgives you. His grace is available. So afterwards, we're in a restaurant, and a server um, walks up, and she's got her plate, and there's like some ribs and coke, and she's holding it, and tears are just streaming down her face. And she said, I want to thank you for letting me know that I could be forgiven. I want to thank you. I carried so much guilt. Thank you for letting me know. I want to let you know there's forgiveness, family. There's grace, family. Whoever has not sinned, throw the first stone. We don't throw stones here. We give away crosses here. All right. Lastly, and I just want this text to just sit, sit on us. We, we believe that the personal creator God was revealed in King Jesus. Um, I want to read some text here, and I just want it to wash over us. Christ is the invisible image of of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So as Christians, we believe that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the one true God, eternally existed, revealed in the person of Jesus. Verse 16, for through him God created everything in the heavens, heavenly realms and on earth. He made things we can see and things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. This is the angelic and demonic world. He goes on, everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation in his hands. He holds creation together. Let me put it specifically. He holds you and I together. I don't know the hell that you're going through. I don't know the mental health struggle you're going through. I don't know the family struggles you're going through. I don't know the unemployment. I, I don't know the health. I don't know any of that. But what I do know this is that the nail-pierced hands of Jesus are still bloody, and they're still strong, and he's still holding you, and he's not going to let go. Even when you think about letting go, he's going to catch you again. He's going to catch you again. He won't let you go. He won't let you go. You're going to make it through. You're going to make it it through. It's not the end of you. You're going to make it through. You hear me? He's a God of breakthroughs. When you don't think you can hold on anymore, he's got you. He's got you. And there's going to be times where you're like, Lord, where are you at? He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. 
I'm here, I'm here. It continues. Christ is also the head of the church. The church is not a building, it's a people, which is his body. You and I are the body of Christ. Listen, we're not complainers, we're doers. We're, we're not gonna complain, it's dark. We're gonna turn on our flashlights and light it up. He, he's the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. Listen, all who, he is supreme over us. Death does not have the last word. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. That's the incarnation. Now watch this, teenagers, watch this. Put this in your pocket. Put it in your soul. Hold it to your chest. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Let me tell you just for a minute because I'm running out of time. But the blood of Christ is so powerful. It not only forgives this whole universe will be healed, no more tears, no more sadness, no more hurt, no more pain. He makes it all new. But until that day, we got his promise that his blood will never fail. Our worship team is going to play for us. And as they're coming out, I want you to begin to prepare your heart and mind And when they're done singing, I'm gonna lead us in a time of prayer.
All of the honor is yours, Jesus. All of the glory, all of the honor is yours. All of the glory, all of the honor is yours. All of the glory, all of the honor is yours. It's yours, it's yours. no sense to say you're worthy of it all despite the hell we're going through. For some of us, we don't even know how we're going to make it to tomorrow. But yet we sing you're worthy of it all. For some of us, we've lost people that are close to us. But we still sing you're worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all because the cross is still bloody and the tomb is still empty. So we have hope and we trust him. 
Let's pray, family. That's our heart's cry, is you are worthy of it all. (laughs) Not because our situation is good, but because you're good even in the bad situation. So we give it up all to you. And we say you are worthy of it all. There is none like you, sweet Jesus. Right now, I believe that there are many who are in need of a blessing. I just want you to put your hands out in front of you and just like a, like a cup, like you're about to receive a blessing. Lord, I pray that you put into the hands that are open what they need for this situation and circumstance. And I believe that there are many watching online and many that are here. It's time for you to follow Jesus. It's time for you to commit your life to him. It's time for you to trust him. The Bible's very clear. It says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he died for your sins and raised on the third day, you will be saved. You will be rescued. You'll have a new life in his kingdom, a new power, sin forgiven, declared his very righteousness, his own. Friends, today is the day. Delay no more. Whether if you're walking, watching online or here physically, if you're ready to trust Jesus, he is extending your, his hand out to you. Take his hand. Say this to him in the silence of your heart. Today, King Jesus, I say yes to you. I believe that should have been me on the cross, but you took my place to give me grace. Nails didn't keep you on a cross, love did. And because of your love, you forgive me with your blood. You declare me righteous. And on the third day when you rose again, you rise in me to new and eternal life in your family. And I choose to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. You may be seated. Before we get to our soul tattoo and action step, if you're, if you're watching online, specifically by television, a QR code's gonna come up. Grab your smartphone, hit the camera app, point it at the QR code. The connection page is gonna come up. If you prayed to receive Jesus, let us know. We want to celebrate with you. We want to get you equipped. We want you to be a part of this family. With technology today, we've got groups popping up all over the place, and it's going to be exciting to see what God does. Let us know. If you don't have a physical connection card, you're doing it digitally on the seat in front of you. There's a QR code. Do the exact same thing. Let us know that you prayed. Those of you with physical connection cards, fill out that information. Say, hey, I prayed to receive Christ. I renewed my faith in Christ. Prayer request, let us know so we can serve you. Family, our soul tattoo is this, God is pro-science. All truth is God's truth. Our action step is this, join us on YouTube tomorrow night for let's talk about that live Q&A. Christelle will be there, I will be there, and my good friend, Dr. Frank Turek, So we want to try to answer as many questions as possible. I love you guys. Me and Miss Vicky going to take seven weeks to study and pray and get prepared for 2023. But we'll be dilly and dallying around, okay? Love y'all, and we'll see you around. 